welcome to week four of the series, You in Five Years, based on messages by Pastor Levi Lusko. In week one, we asked the question, who do I want to be five years from now? And is that where I'm heading? Because if I'm heading is not where I want to be, now is the time to make a change. In week two, we asked the question, why? Why is it so difficult? And we found the answer is inertia. Inertia is either our best friend when we are an object in motion or our worst enemy when we are an object at rest. Then last week we asked the question how? How are we going to change? And the answer was one step at a time. What God wants us to do is not always going to have visible progress. We are going to be taking steps to obedience long before we see the effects of it paying off in our lives. And this week we want to ask the question, when? When are we going to find the time in our lives to make these steps that we are going to move us towards where we want to be? This week's message is called, From Evening to Morning. Forty times in the Bible the words evening and morning, or morning and evening, occur in the same verse. And here are just two examples. Firstly from Exodus 16, verses 11 to 12. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites, so tell them, this evening you will eat meat, and in the morning you will have all the bread that you want, and then you will know that you can trust in the Lord your God. Or this one from Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 6. Sow your seed in the morning, and at the evening let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will equally do well. Or in other words, sow your seed, but don't just stand around waiting to see it grow. Use the time to be busy with the next project. What about the return of Christ? When will that happen? Morning or evening? Well, in his own words, he said, it could be this evening, or it could be at midnight, or it could be when the rooster crows, it could be at dawn. He wasn't merely keeping his options open, he was keeping us on our toes. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. That's from Matthew 24, 42 and 44. There are many verses we could have turned to in scripture to find the words evening and morning. They're all over the Bible. But let's start at the very, very beginning in Genesis 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light god saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness god called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day consider this the evening and the morning were the first day the first time the concept of a day occurs in the bible it was defined in scripture as an evening followed by a morning, dark followed by light. That's different to how we think about it. The day actually begins at 12 a.m. But most of us think of a brand new day as when we get out of bed in the morning, when technically we've been in that day since midnight. Scripture's construct of a day begins when the sun goes down. That's how the Jews considered their day. They viewed it from sunset to sunset. A 24 hour period, the evening, followed by the rest of the 24 hours. While sunset occurs at different times in different locations and seasons, for myself here in Saudi Arabia in winter, it currently sets at quarter past five and rises at half past six. That's 13 and a quarter hours and that's the period of time I want to focus on. Why? From the evening when the sun goes down to the morning when the sun comes up, that's the window of your time to take the small steps that are going to change your life. 
We may usually think of our day from when we leave the house for work or school until we arrive at home, say eight o'clock in the morning to half past five in the evening, just nine and a half hours. But it is this section of our day over which we have the least control. Most of us have things that we have to do during this period of time, taking the children to school, driving to work, I have to be in this meeting, this is when the doctor's appointment is, this is when the dentist appointment is, this is when the bank is open, this is when the dry cleaner is open, this is when the post office is open. And then for parents, there are all of the after school activities to manage too. Everything has to fit into these few hours and this can be chaotic and full of unpredictability. Even in the best of circumstances, we tend to focus on and push things in to the time period we have the least control over and neglect the far superior period of our lives that is probably the most disproportionately powerful when it comes to actually affecting the life that you live. So what I think we should do is stop focusing on how we normally view our day, but think of our life in terms of from evening to morning. These 13 or so hours which are relatively unused. What I want to say to you in this message is this, if you anchor your evenings and your mornings, then you can better handle the busy middle section of your day. You can cope with the traffic, the forgotten lunchbox or the sports kit or a long stressful meeting because it's really hard to have a bad day that starts and ends well. So how can we make this happen? Number one, get enough sleep. Why is it so hard? Two words, his name is Thomas Edison and he's ruining your night's sleep. The day was the 31st of December in the year 1879 and for the first time in a public setting, Thomas Edison flipped the switch on his invention, the incandescent light bulb, and the whole world found out what could happen when there was this unnatural light that could be commanded at the touch of a button. <clears throat> Before this moment, momentous event, on average during the week, your great-great-grandparents in 1879 were sleeping a good 10 hours per night. All across America, the average amount of sleep that people got in this block was 10 hours. Fast forward to the present time. Average Westerners, with the addition of the light bulb, on, average, on an average weeknight, sleep 6 hours and 51 in minutes. So we've gone from 10 hours of sleep to 6 hours and 51 minutes of sleep per night. And that's not an improvement. Before then, there were only candles or lanterns to illuminate activities that extended beyond nightfall, which limited what was possible. So for the most part, when the sun went down, you went to bed. They ate, they talked for a while by the fire, and then they went to sleep. But now you have lights on whenever you need to, and so we are getting less sleep because we have artificial light. The Brits had their own nemesis in Joseph Swan, who was a transatlantic contemporary of Edison. Of course, we could go further from Edison and Swan and talk about Frank Canova, the IBM engineer who invented the smartphone, and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs who took the concept of an all-in-one smart technology further. Now these screens and the blue light that comes from them alters our sleep patterns and our body's ability to produce melatonin, which is involved in synchronising circadian rhythms, including sleep, waking time and blood pressure regulation. All of this has diminished our ability to get a good night's sleep and that causes a whole range of problems. Sarah Mednick, an associate professor of psychology at UC Riverside, said this, Studies have conclusively linked sleeplessness to irritability, irritability, anger, depression and mental exhaustion. You don't eat well when you haven't slept well. You're not in a good mood when you haven't slept well. You don't have as much energy when you haven't slept well and just everything spirals out of control. Lack of sleep can affect your immune system, making you more susceptible to illness. 
Studies show that people who don't get enough quality sleep are more likely to become ill after being exposed to a virus such as the common cold virus. Lack of sleep can also affect how fast you recover if you do become ill. And that's not the only impact. There's also a dangerous impairment that takes place when you don't sleep. Tom Rath, author of the book Sleep, Move, Eat, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal that showed that if you aren't getting enough sleep, then even over a relatively short period of time, it has the same effect of drinking enough alcohol to induce a sensation of feeling drunk. So consider this. Would you like to travel on a plane piloted by someone who has just finished their fourth pint before they fly you? Would you like to get into a car when someone has just downed their fourth whiskey? Would you like to be admitted for an operation and know the anaesthetist just before has finished a bottle of Chateau Neuf de Pas? And why in the world would you want to put anyone in that position yourself? Because lack of sleep had impaired your ability. And it goes on from there. So all-nighters, burning the candle at both ends or spending time on blue light technology when we should be sleeping has an effect on our body beyond just feeling tired. What is the optimal amount of sleep? Studies vary and it also depends on age, but there's some consensus that it's eight hours. That's the amount of sleep we should be aiming for, though in many studies, top performers get an average of eight hours and 36 minutes per sleep per night. Our new day begins because the sun's gone down. So what are we doing to prepare ourselves for sleep? Well, we set alarms when we should get up, perhaps. We should be setting alarms for when we need to go to bed. Once in bed, what should we do? Well, what we definitely shouldn't do is filling our brains with blue light. Stay off YouTube clips, Facebook scrolling and video games. These are all stimulating, sending signals bouncing off the back of your eye and going into your brain, causing adrenaline to flood through your system. You can't do this and then expect yourself just to lie there and doze off. Having trouble falling asleep, it's no wonder because we're doing the exact opposite of what we want our system to do. It's like having the windows down and the heater on in your car because you're sending your body mixed messages. You're sending stimulation and that tells it to be awake, be alert, be ready to pounce at a moment's notice. But then you're also trying to get your body to quieten down. You should think of a gradual calming down towards when you want to fall asleep. So that's number one, get enough sleep. And the second is this, when you wake up, Go deep. Deep in what way? Spiritually, physically, creatively. Spiritually is most important, of course. Psalm 46.10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. Now perhaps your deep spiritual time happens before you go to sleep, and that's brilliant. Adam did it that way. God walked with Adam in the garden, in the cool of the day. Adam would have his deep spiritual time with God, maybe just as the sun went down and the cool air started to creep through the garden. But the point is, we are being still and knowing that he is God at some point and being able to go deep in our relationship with him. When we want to also be able to go deep physically, mean that we build up our bodies by doing something that's good for them. We take a brisk walk or we do that single push-up that we talked about. It's important because when you work out physically or do some form of physical activity, it enhances your mood and improves your focus naturally, which is far better than having to take medication to achieve this. Sadly, many today are looking to drugs to do what we actually could achieve in our own lives. We're the most over-medicated generation that's ever lived hands down. Yet the fact is, in exercise, we are giving a natural mood-improving focus, enhancing boost that we can do for ourselves. I don't know if you like to exercise at night or in the morning, but I can actually make the case for morning workouts. 
The effect of a mood boost lasts for about 12 hours. So if you exercise in the evening, the biggest benefit is happening while you're not awake to appreciate it. So if early in the day you can find some way to exercise and get your system going, then you will have 12 hours of mood boost and enhanced focus to use however you want during your day. So we want to go deep spiritually, we want to go deep physically, and we want to go deep in our creative endeavours. Why would we focus on creativity? And this might seem strange for those who work in IT or accounting or engineering. But I would argue that based on my reading of 1 Genesis 27, God the Creator created us and we are made in his image. We were created to be creative and whatever we're called to do, we are called to do it creatively. To creatively come up with IT solutions to creatively come up with engineering solutions, to creatively create art and photography, to creatively parent and to lead, to creatively approach politics or film making or fashion, or whatever line of work that God has us in. Although creative accounting is best avoided if we want to stay the right side of the taxman. So we guard our sleep time, then we wake up, hopefully we can carve out some time to go deep in our bodies, to go deep in our spirits, but also to go deep in our advancing of what goal we have five years from now. I believe this is the best time to take your baby steps. It's the best time to take an online class. So if it's a book you want to read, remember the 10 pages a day that are going to lead you to have read those 60 books between now and the end of five years. Well, this is your space of time to attack the day. I find this to be the most interruptible time, or it should be in our lives, because the whole world is at rest, isn't fully functioning yet. So you shouldn't expect the phone calls. You shouldn't expect all of those normal routine interruptions. So it should happen right there. In his book, Deep Work by Cal Newport, an associate professor at Georgetown University. He talks about how more than ever in our day, people working deep is lacking because we're living in an age of multitasking. We're all doing a thousand things at one time. Oh, I'm watching a film, I'm reading my messages, I'm folding laundry, all at the same time. In the book, he makes the case that true multitasking is a myth that our brains can actually only do one thing at one time. So whatever we would call multitasking, he would say, is going from one thing to another quickly and poorly. Think about this. What's the first thing you do when you're lost while driving? I know this will be harder for the men because they never admit to getting lost. Perhaps just a creative new way of reaching a destination. The first thing you do is turn off the music. You didn't mind it when you were just zoned out on driving, and a lot of times we can drive on autopilot. We can be appreciating the music because we know where we are going. But the moment you realise, I, I don't know where I'm going, now you really want to focus on driving. And so you just want the music off because you weren't actually multitasking. You were just listening to the music and driving on autopilot. I'm a very nervous driver and a poor navigator, so I never drive the car with the music on and I don't like people speaking to me either. He talks about deep work, meaning where we actually bear down on one thing and give all of ourselves to it. Because what happens when you go from one thing to another? He calls in the book, Attention Residue. He says scientists can track how your brain functions when you move from one task to another. It produces tiny hooks that stay in the previous task. So you move on, but there's these little hooks that are holding on to the task. And the more things you engage in, the more hooks your brain produces, which are pulled in many different directions. Every time you make a jump in what you're focusing on, you have less of yourself to give to it because there's all of these tiny hooks pulling you back to the previous tasks and there's much less of what you can give to focus on the task in hand. What we need to do is focus on deep work where we can actually give ourselves in a serious way to one thing at a time. Alexandra Graham Bell, some 
Adi, who contributed to the world in a pretty profound way, found time to work deeply, and he explained how this is possible. Concentrate all of your thoughts upon the work in hand. The sun's rays do not burn until brought into focus. You can use the sun to create fire, but only if you have something to focus it. If you have a magnifying glass, you can use the sun to create fire, but it takes a focus to produce the flame. Unfortunately, overstimulation and the tendency towards so-called multitasking has created a brain that finds it harder to stay focused. So what can we do? Firstly, make a plan. There's a business saying, failing to plan is planning to fail. So have a plan. Plan your day and use your time wisely. It's a gift, so don't waste it. Every time you reach for your phone or the TV remote or the games console, think about what else you could be doing instead that will actually be promoting brain growth and not destroying it. That would add to your spiritual, physical or creative deepness. Benjamin Franklin was really good at planning. He would obsessively plan out his day and regiment every minute but apparently the first thing he would do when his feet hit the floor would be to ask the question, what good shall I do this day? That was his plan. How much better would our lives become if we woke up saying, what good shall I do this day? So we make a plan. Last week we talked about how we should be recording things, we should be taking notes of our progress. Did we get our push-up in or floss that moaner, remember? So we make our plan, but then how do we find out whether we followed our plan? We take notes, we keep score. By simply measuring something, we automatically improve it. A great deal of what we learn from history is because people wrote things down. People kept diaries of their days. I know I used to myself, but somehow it's become a lost art. Just think about it. How do you ever learn about historical events if there wasn't any note-taking, often detailed, by ordinary, average people? Consider Abraham Lincoln's assassination by John Wilkes Booth. He kept a diary. And in that diary, on the day he killed Abraham Lincoln, having broken his leg, landing on a stage, jumping on a horse, riding through town, ending up hiding out in a barn. And what does he do? He's back at home, his bone is sticking out of his leg, and he writes in his diary the details of the assassination of President Lincoln. We only have the details we do because he kept notes on it. There are other many examples of learning history from the diaries and notebooks that people kept. Anne Frank, Captain Robert Scott, Leonardo da Vinci, Lewis Carroll to name but a few. But you are living history. The God who made the heavens and the earth loves you and lives in you and works in you and goes before you. You are part of the greatest thing that's ever happened the advancing of the kingdom of God, the building of the local church, the changing of life in every day, whether you go to work as a banker or you show up as a football coach or your assistant chemistry professor at a community college. If you're living history, who is going to know what God did through you if you're not writing anything down, if you aren't recording all of the good things that God is doing in your life? keeping you on track of your goals and moving forward, being fully purposed by him. Just think about this. Where would we be today if the authors of the Bible hadn't written anything down? Think about not only having a plan about what you want your day to be like, but then after you've lived that day, before you go to sleep, how about making part of your shutdown ritual, pulling out a diary and taking some notes about that day? Wrote 50 words, wrote 500 words for my new message. That's a small step, 
but I note that I wrote 500 today and I wrote 500 yesterday and 500 the day before that. And I can look back and I can see that I have 10 days right now in my chain and I'm excited about that. That's 5,000 words. Then I write down that I smile. I'm excited to record it. I can also write down how far I walked, how many pages of a book I read, what I made for dinner, which actually helps with my menu planning. How did God help me in that day? So along with having a plan for the day, I'm going deep spiritually, physically, and creatively. I'm also going to take notes about what I did and how I achieved it. Additionally, keeping notes is also a way that we can reflect when things don't quite go to plan. If I've not had the day that I wanted to have, when we can ponder how we might have done things better or differently, when we could have been a better boss, employee, friend, parent, son, daughter, husband, wife, and a better Christian. And a bit like my slimming class members having to record their meals, having to write things down can often help in making better choices in the first place. Another thing that helps me is time blocks. It's easy to become distracted when we are trying to focus on something. So saying I'm going to intensely focus on this for an hour or whatever time span you allocate can really help you. You do this one task and nothing else for the time you have said you're going to dedicate to it. If I think about something and I want to text, I'm going to stay focused. If I think about something and I want to tweet, I'm going to stay focused. In fact, turn your phone off and don't be drawn away by any pings and beeps. Dedicate a chunk of time and focus on nothing but this one task. The temptation is to flit from thing to thing, creating those tiny hooks in your brain. Instead, say this, I'm going to work on this task for 25 minutes or 60 minutes or 40 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever time you've allocated to your chunk, but do it without interruptions. The time management gurus say your brain actually works in waves, waves that are 90 minutes long. And if you ride the wave of effort for 90 minutes, then you should give yourself a little break to maximize productivity. But you should not use that break to put on Netflix or go on Instagram. The best thing to do would be to take a walk, a quick lap around the block, or something that's a way to refresh yourself before you plunge in again and ride these waves. Make a cup of tea or a cool drink and look out on the wonderful world that our God has created for us to enjoy. Prioritising is the key. Until I've checked off my three boxes of deep spiritual, deep physical and deep creativity, I don't want to give my brain the dopamine hit of reading an email or social media. It takes effort and training to form these good habits. I know I have a better day if I do my Bible study first thing, but it's also tempting just to have a quick peek at Facebook or messages or BBC news. And then it's easy to become wrapped up in cute puppy videos or the latest political scandal. And an hour has gone by just like that. Then I'm disappointed with myself. Once I have accomplished something that I've set out to do, then I'll give myself the treat of social media. And yet, even now that I've spoken that, it's actually sad to think that I'm associating it as a treat. I'm, like I'm treating myself like a pet, because that's the effect it has on your brain, social media and YouTube. It's like a little piece of chocolate, and you'll want that again. And again. When I was running my swimming classes, often members would reward themselves for a good weight loss with a cake or a curry, but I wanted to get them to use non food rewards. These could be a beauty treat or going to visit the cinema or a new item of clothing, thus breaking the association of rewarding themselves 
with the very thing that had caused the problem in the first place. And I'm hoping that we can move forward towards a state of mind where we can wean ourselves away from dependency on the quick fixes of social media and YouTube for our dopamine hit and find the same enjoyment in taking a brisk walk in the beautiful creation that our God has made for us. And there's a third reason. You should find ways now and again to be inaccessible. Airplane mode, not near your phone, whatever it is, we need to get away from the idea that I need to be reachable all of the time. Of course, if you've got children, there are exceptions to the rule. I think phone calls are a pretty good exception. You can turn data off, but still have phone calls on for emergencies. We have this need that's a relatively modern notion of constant accessibility being a huge priority. But let's rewind. The Revolutionary War was won with what sort of correspondence? Mail. George Washington wrote letters to the Continental Congress for permission to do something. He just had to wait for the post to come back. Time was of the essence, but he was writing a letter. I thought about the fact that we put a man on the moon without text messages or email. And that was indeed a life before the smartphone. This idea of constant accessibility being so important is a relatively modern thing. So choose to be inaccessible at times and that will actually help you as well. We spoke earlier about making the use of the time between sunset and sunrise. And we're looking at the art of making most of our early mornings before we start our workday. But what about our evening time? Are we using that productively? Do you come home from work and immediately plonk yourself in front of the TV or a console? How much time do you spend watching secular TV? Do you say you just don't have time to do things? When? If only you're, you took time out from technology and from the world, you would. Time to be working on your five year plan. Time to be going deep with God. Time to have quality experiences with your spouse and family. What are your priorities? Which brings me to the last point. This final idea has been helping me of letting the sun go down on technology. So I have pockets of time for social media, pockets of time for email and messages and catching up on the news. But then when I get to a point and the sun's going down on my day, I want to have a sunset, technologically speaking, a digital sundown. In the book Deep Work, Carl Newport actually says he shuts his computer down, he turns off his phone and after just one last check and then he says he makes the shutdown complete. It's this little ritual that he has and then he can go and be present with his family. Then you can go and give yourself to the dinner and give yourself to be fully present for your wife or your husband and fully present for your children. And so, when you've done all this, restful sleeping and a productive morning, and you've planned a wonderful evening, the filling that moves you towards going to sleep, if you're anchored in the morning and anchored in the evening, then come what may, You've already had a phenomenal day. Father, we're grateful the model that you gave us in creation of the sun going down and the new day beginning. Adam and Eve met with you in the cool of the evening then slept and woke up to do all that you had called them to do. I pray that we would take advantage of the time that we do have, that we have control over. It's easy to focus on the time we don't have, but I pray that we would remember time is spent and not found. We are all given the same 24 hours and I pray that you give us the grace and the wisdom to spend it well. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.